are joining us online and to those who are coming in person. Uh, my name is Rachel Fleming and I'm here with the Spanish Graduate Student Organization, which together with Dr. Brendel and the Spanish Heritage Track has organized this lecture series. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to mention why we have organized this series and these events. So many of the TAs here in Spanish and in other languages too, increasingly interact with students with who have heritage language backgrounds. And the Spanish heritage track here has often invited speakers to come and talk to the students to teach them about their own uh, bilingualism process to help them to feel empowered to know what is going on with their language learning uh, so that they can continue to develop their linguistic skills. But our TAs, uh, we don't currently have a program to train and equip them in the nuances of heritage language learning. So in view of that, and in view of the fact that many of our TAs will go on to teach in programs, either directly working with heritage language learners or in departments that have heritage language programs or need to develop them, we wanted to give our TAs the opportunity to have some exposure to the fundamentals of heritage language learning and instruction. And so we hope that this serves to equip uh, are the TAs in our department, but also all attendees with the knowledge they need to be informed language instructors that can empower heritage language learners. With that said, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jocely Miners. Dr. Miners is Associate Professor of Instruction in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Texas at Austin. A native of San Jose, Costa Rica, she came to the US to attend the University of Texas at Austin, where she obtained her undergraduate education, as well as an MA in French linguistics and a PhD in Hispanic linguistics. Dr. Miner specializes in teaching and developing courses for heritage Spanish learners, as well as Spanish for healthcare professionals, and courses with an experiential learning component as well. She also serves as co-director for the Texas Coalition for Heritage Spanish, where she collaborates with other Texas universities and works on promoting open pedagogies and the use of open educational resources to advance the field of heritage Spanish instruction. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Miners. Thank you so much, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? This. I know this is a hybrid event, so we always have to be careful with technology. If people can hear me on the Zoom and then in the room. And now I'm going to try to share my screen, see if that works. So here we are. Can you all see my screen? Okay. So thank you so much for the introduction. And First of all, I want to thank you all for inviting me to give this lecture today. It's an honor to be here. I want to thank the Heritage Spanish track at FSU and my dear colleague, Anel, for inviting me to present. And I guess I'll start by giving you all a little bit of a background about myself. And uh, I think Rachel said a little bit about where kind of where I grew up and I I have a pretty mixed cultural background. My my grandparents were Chinese immigrants who came, two of my grandparents who came to Costa Rica and Nicaragua. And so I was born in Costa Rica, but I have a very mixed background. And I was very fortunate to go to a bilingual school since preschool, basically. So I grew up speaking both English and Spanish since a very young age. And then I had the privilege of coming to Austin to attend the University of Texas at Austin, and I never left, basically. I'm still here. And I, I finished my graduate degree, but my last year, I was able to teach one Heritage Spanish class, and that kind of changed my life. And I really, it was my favorite class that I ever taught, and I decided that's what I wanted to continue doing. So here I am. Um, I've been teaching Heritage Spanish for over 10 years now, and I'm going to share today a little bit about what I've learned during these past 10 plus years. So uh, I was told that this lecture was for a group of graduate students who perhaps have none or very little training in heritage Spanish education. So I'm going, I planned this, this lecture in a way that kind of gives you the basics a little bit and gives you an introduction 
to heritage Spanish and why we teach Spanish as a heritage language. And then like the title of the presentation says, it's past, present, and future. So a little bit about the past, the evolution of the field, uh, what has happened, and I'm calling this from linguistic development to social engagement, and then some uh, approaches that are being used in the present, and I'm going to focus specifically on critical pedagogies and open pedagogies, and then a little bit about the future, and here I'll just leave you with some key words that I'm going to be mentioning, student empowerment, community engagement, social justice, and social transformation. So let's start by talking uh, very briefly defining what is a heritage learner. And I'm just gonna use the most widely cited definition by Guadalupe Valdez, which says uh, a heritage learner is an individual who was raised in a home where a non-English language is spoken, who speaks or only understands the heritage language and who is to some degree bilingual in English and the heritage language. Now, if we look at this definition, we see that it is a very broad definition because if we see it's to some degree and speaks or only understand, you know, there can be a wide range of speakers who fall in there. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. I would like to spend a few minutes talking about why we teach Spanish as a heritage language. And for that, I thought we could use some background information about the Hispanic population in the US. And before I I go into this. So I this data is from the Pew Research Center. And so you'll notice sometimes the word Hispanic and sometimes the word Latino. At this point, I'm going with the wording from the Pew Research Center. But if you want to talk about labels, and uh, that's a whole nother talk uh, that we could go into another day. But today, I'm just going to use what the Pew Research Center says. So I'm going to read you a few of the important uh, bullet points here. So in 2022, Hispanics made up nearly one in five people in the U.S., which is up from 16% in 2010, and it was only 5% in 1970. So there has been a huge growth. Hispanics are the largest racial or ethnic group in California and Texas, where I am. And then Texas, California, and Florida have seen the biggest Hispanic population growth since 2010. So this is relevant since I know uh, a lot of the audience today is in Florida. And then this is important. Newborns and not immigrants have been uh, driving this recent growth among U.S. Hispanics. And what does that mean? That most of the people who are considered Hispanics now are being born here. So they're being exposed to both languages from birth. So some data about the use of Spanish in the U.S. Well, the share of Latinos in the U.S. who speak English proficiency, proficiently is growing. In 2022, 72% of Latinos ages five and older spoke English proficiently, which was up 59 from 59% in 2000. So that's a big change too. And like I said earlier, U.S. born Latinos are driving this growth. At the same time, the share of Latinos who speak Spanish at home has declined from 78% to 68%. And also that is due to the U.S. born, which if you think about it, it makes sense. If you're born here, then you're exposed to English early and you're using English at school. So your use of Spanish will probably decline. However, even though the share of Latinos who speak Spanish at home has declined, the number of those who do so has grown because of the overall growth in the Latino population. So we still see a growing number of Latinos who speak Spanish at home. Now, to what degree they speak Spanish is another question, but here you can see the uh, proficiency of all Latinos. So in the yellow, it's how much they speak Spanish at home, and then the brown, where they speak English proficiently. So all Latinos, you know, we have downward trend with the yellow and upward trend with the brown. U.S. born Latinos, uh, a bigger change in the English proficiency going up and going down, a bigger change in the Spanish at home. And then the foreign born, the immigrants, of course, their uh, Spanish use is pretty steady. So let's keep going and talk about the Spanish spoken by Hispanics in the US. So this is also from the Pew Research Center and they found that while most US Latinos speak Spanish, not all of them do, we know that, about half of US Hispanics who do not speak Spanish have been shamed because of it. So there is linguistic discrimination. Some Hispanics even make jokes about those who do not speak Spanish. And they also found that, of course, Spanglish use is widespread among US Hispanics, and we all know that as well. And finally, they learned that personal Hispanic identity is or can be strongly related to the people's views about Spanish, so language ideologies. 
And now getting closer to our talk today, uh, let's talk about educational levels of Hispanics in the US. Between the fall of 2010 and 2021, the percentage of public school students who are Hispanic increased from 23 to 28%. So that is a big number of students, of children who in our schools who are Hispanic. And it's estimated that by 2030, this number will reach 30%. Now, uh, the share of US Hispanics with college experience has also increased. About 45% of US Hispanic adults ages 25 and older had at least some college experience in 2022, which was up from 36% in 2010. And the number of Latinos enrolled in college or postgraduate education also increased up to 4.2 million. So what does this mean? There's more of the Hispanic Latino population who are attending our universities. And so let's talk now about our own universities. So where I teach at the University of Texas at Austin, we have 25.2% of students who are Hispanic. And that made us a couple of years ago, we became officially a Hispanic serving institution. And I did some research on your university. FSU has 20.5% of students who are Hispanic. And this number, of course, continues to grow. So given this uh, background, what kinds of students are we seeing in our Spanish classes? And how do we best serve the student population? And so to think about that, we have to think about, well, how are they different from second language learners or the rest of the learners who are coming in to learn Spanish in our classes? So I'm gonna take uh, a few minutes to talk about uh, some differences between second language and heritage language learners, though I know that my colleague Flavia Belpoliti will give a workshop tomorrow where she will go into more detail about this. But uh, I'm gonna use uh, Potowski's claim when she said that a heritage language and second language learners are different linguistically, effectively, and academically. And we'll discuss this a little bit. So let's think about how learners acquire the language meaning heritage language learners acquire language at home from birth usually versus uh, second language learners who learn in a school setting, in a formal setting. And then what variety they learn. So if you're growing up with uh, Spanish at home, you're learning whatever language variety your family speaks. And it's usually uh, just a home informal language variety. And when you learn for the first time in a classroom, most likely they're teaching you like a standard prestige variety of the language. So then when the students come to our classrooms, the type of knowledge they possess is very different, right? It's not just the linguistic knowledge, but we know that heritage language learners come to our classrooms with mm, a lot of really strong, pragmatic, social, cultural knowledge, et cetera. And then most importantly, their motivation to study the language can be very different. So we have very diverse reasons why students want to learn the language or improve their language skills. But for the heritage language learners, it's often very personal, very uh, emotional. They want to be able to speak with their uh, families better. They travel to Latin America and they want to talk to their families. They want to speak with their grandparents. And they also have all these affective factors. They've often been, been uh, shamed because they don't speak Spanish how they're supposed to because of their last name or their heritage, or because you know, they, they feel like because of their cultural identity, that is some people feel like it's a requirement to speak Spanish. So there's a lot of factors, affective factors, motivational that come into play for heritage learners that not necessarily come into play for second language learners. And so the bottom line is that second language and heritage language learners have very different pedagogical needs in regarding what they need to learn and how they're gonna need to learn it. And this is why having mixed classes can be very challenging. And uh, there has been a lot of research done on how to approach mixed classes. We have uh, the differential, differentiated instruction. Maria Carrera has done a lot of work on this. And I am not going to go into much detail about that today because my time is limited, but I think Flavia tomorrow will address that a little bit more. For now, I want to talk about uh, our heritage learners. So we know that they're different from the second language learners, but are they all the same? Well, of course not. They are a very heterogeneous group. And some of the variables that make them different are if you think about their personal history, their level of exposure to the language, the varieties that they've learned from their families and how much formal education in the language. So to illustrate this, I'll give you some examples. We have students who 
were born abroad in a Latin American country and came when they were in elementary school or maybe middle school. And so those students have a strong background in the language. They're uh, then the ones who were born here and they were they grew up with parents who didn't speak any English. So they had to speak Spanish all the time, always. Versus the ones who grew up here, were born here, and their parents are fully bilingual. So they maybe heard Spanish all the time, but they would respond in English all the time, and they weren't really forced to speak Spanish. And about the language varieties, we get so many different uh, varieties of Spanish. We have, of course, a great majority here in Texas, a great majority of our learners have Mexican heritage, but we do have students who have heritage from Central America, South America. I've even had students who have uh, parents who came here from Spain. So there's such a wide range of learners and we can say they can be from receptive. So people who just understand the language to fully fluent or as uh, Tim Potoski uh, labeled it, they she said um, they could be learners with just heritage motivation, which means they don't know, maybe they don't have an, gotten any linguistic knowledge, but they have the heritage of the exposure to the culture. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have what they call native or homeland speakers, the students who were born in, say, Mexico, and they came here during middle school or high school, but they still end up in our classes. So this makes it very challenging, right? We have this wide range of students. And of course, it makes it hard for course placement. Like, where do we place these students? Did they uh, take AP Spanish and, you know, they have learned a lot of Spanish or some went to a dual language bilingual program. And so they have grown up with Spanish versus some who come to our classes and it's the first time ever that they are taking a formal Spanish class. So this can be quite challenging. So there is a large and growing body of research on SHL pedagogy, but I'd like when I'm, to start talking about this, I'd like to uh, use what Maria Carrera said that we really need to think about what we teach, how we teach, and why we teach it. And to teach Spanish as a heritage language, we need to start with the learners. We need to think about their needs and their wants. We need to analyze the student population and set specific goals for those students. We know it's not the same teaching Spanish heritage learners, for example, in Miami versus New York versus El Paso, Texas. We have very different populations and even within different universities, different groups of students who have different goals that we need to uh, be aware of. So as the field has advanced, there have been shifts in approaches, methodologies, and goals for our students. And um, we're gonna talk about these a little bit today, but my question I think that we should be asking is, what do these students need in order to fully own and embrace their bilingualism and biculturalism with pride and use it to contribute positively to our society, because I think in the end, that's our, our goal, right? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the past. Here's where I start talking about the past and the evolution of the field. And so in a paper by Giron Setien Belpoliti, they've seen that there's been a transformation in the field. And so the initial focus in the field of SHL was to develop more linguistic features, literacy, and it was kind of a transposition of the L2 models into heritage language teaching. And there has been this shift where now we are doing a more systemic functional linguistics and sociolinguistic approaches, which really means we're focusing more on language use and functions in specific social settings. And so there's these all these new perspectives coming up, like critical pedagogies, inquiry-based, project-based learning, service-based learning, experiential learning models, to name a few. Um, I'm going to name a few more, multiliteracies, translanguaging practices. And for those who are not familiar with the term translanguaging, uh, here what we mean is instead of be seeing a bilingual speaker as having two separate kind of codes, two languages, right? Translanguages treats it as one, basically one form of communication that the owner, that the speaker possesses but the speaker can use resources from two languages, right? Um, so then there's technology-driven instruction and a, a greater focus nowadays on learner variables such as motivation, linguistic insecurity, and language anxiety, among others. 
So to talk about the evolution of the field, uh, my colleague Flavia Belpoliti uh, came up with this kind of conceptualization of what changes we have seen based on goals and perspectives in the field. And we have it separated into different, what we call four dimensions, okay? So I'm gonna just briefly explain each one. The first one says from language maintenance and expansion to linguistic discovery and empowerment. And so language maintenance has always been a goal for heritage language education, but, and we're not saying it's no longer a goal. It's still a very important goal, but what has changed is uh, it's kind of been reframed as explained by Budrian Bergara Wilson through the critical language awareness perspectives. We are now not thinking of just, you know, continuing the language, but having really the learners be like conscious, making conscious decisions to explore the benefits of their bilingualism as related to sociopolitical and historical issues so that they can really be empowered to continue using the language and transmitting it in their families and their, and their communities. Um, the second one says language variation, recognition, or we can call it acceptance too, to critical language awareness. So this is deals more with the language itself. And in early approaches, the goal was for students to acquire a standard or a prestige variety of the language and not giving uh, any much value to other varieties of the language, right? Um, nowadays, through the critical language awareness, we know that uh, we need to examine and question linguistic variation as a sociocultural construct, which means we legitimize and we celebrate students' own home varieties and their translanguaging practices and we try to create spaces to discuss and reflect on these language ideologies in our society. And I will talk more in detail about critical language awareness in a little bit. Our third dimension is from foreign language to nuestra lengua, our language. What does this mean? So traditionally, uh, Spanish has been seen as a foreign language, right? And lately there's been this call to kind of transform all our, our programs by researchers such as uh, Olguín Mendoza, Torres, Pascual y Cabo, uh, Prada, etc. And it's, if you think about it, given the history of Spanish in this country and the demographic changes that we talked about, the level of language use in this country, really, there's nothing foreign about Spanish in the U.S. So this call to make it about nuestra lengua is to really focus on the Spanish in and of the US and to transform this kind of traditional uh, view of Spanish as a foreign language into more of a focus on the Spanish heritage varieties in the US. So this means that both second language and heritage language programs would explore Spanish focusing on the Spanish in the US along with the sociocultural and historic events that shape Hispanic communities in the United States. And finally, uh, the last one is maybe the most important one because it focuses on the learners themselves. And so the change has been, instead of seeing language learners as just active recipients and uh, of the lang language learning process, I mean, passive recipients, instead of seeing as passive recipients, we're seeing them more as active participants. So agents of social change, cultural experts, linguistic explorers, community um, advocates. So giving them a central role and an active role in the learning process. And I will talk more a little bit about this later on, but this was to give you an overview of kind of like the goals and perspectives have shifted in the past couple decades. And there's another way of looking at this that's more historical that was conceived by Losa and Budri, and what they call it is the three waves of criticality. There's been kind of three ways in how the field has been approached. The first wave is uh, the basically eradication approach, and this sounds harsh, but what it means was that students would come to the Spanish class and, with their own language varieties, and basically the goal was to impose the prestige variety, the norm or the standard language, and erase their home varieties of language because they had no value, right? That was the first wave. The second wave is what we call the appropriateness approach. And in this approach, all varieties of the language are equally valid, respected, and valued 
And so each student, you know, comes with their variety and it's valued. But uh, there is a dis there's a distinction between when and where and how you can use certain varieties. So what is appropriate for some contexts is not appropriate for another context. So even though it validates the ling linguistic varieties, it kind of encapsulates them in different uh, situations. Now, the third wave is what Losa and Boudry call the critical turn of critical language awareness. It's where uh, we start looking at language in more of a critical way, which I will go into more detail because now I'm going to talk about the present. So now we're done talking about the present. The critical language awareness approach is what uh, is has become more popular recently. And so to explain a little bit about this, uh, we need to think about what language awareness is versus critical language awareness as stated by Clark et al. in the 90s. Uh, language awareness means you're aware of the different varieties of language. Critical language awareness means you're thinking about it critically. It's as simple as that. But um, what they say, Clark and Ivanich, is that if you use critical language awareness, you can empower learners by providing them with a critical analytical framework to help them reflect on their own language experiences and practices, the language practices of others in institutions of which they're a part, and in the wider society within which they live. And Losa and Boudry explain this by saying that the notion of critical is an explicit positionality against ideological and institutional discrimination. So this is very um, kind of theoretical, right? So I wanna talk a little bit about what it is in practice for our students. So uh, Boudry et al have uh, kind of a, an outline of goals that you would have if you're implementing critical language awareness instruction. So according to Boudreau, if you're using CLA, the students will be able to first see language variation as natural and recognize the intrinsic value of their own variety and all other varieties. Two, to develop a consciousness of the political, social, and economic power structures that underlie language use and the distribution of the so-called prestige and non-prestige varieties. Three, to uncover dominant language ideologies that hide in daily monolingual or bilingual practices. And four, to be empowered to exercise agency in making their own decisions about language use and bilingualism. So those are the four goals. And now I will show you a little bit about what I've learned from Diego Pascual y Cabo, who uh, gave a great presentation of some ways that you can enact these CLA principles, so more practical ways. So first of all, we need to focus more on the student's relationship with the language than on the language itself. And focus on what students know and not on what they don't know, because we know that they already come into the classroom with so much knowledge. And if we focus on what they already know, we can empower them and really give them ownership and showcase their expertise in the language. Uh, we need to explore the attitudes of their communities toward the language, as well as the sociolinguistic situation and the community's linguistic history and help students value their own dialects so that they can use them confidently. We need to embrace bilingualism and translanguaging and really use these as valuable resources in the learning process. And we have to be aware, like I said earlier, of the effective and emotional factors in the learning process for our students. Finally, we need to let the students make their own decisions regarding their language use, but we need to first equip them with knowing the consequences of those decisions. And all of this should lead to empowering our students to be agents of social change. So that is in a nutshell, the critical language awareness. And that is the first approach that I wanted to discuss with you today. The second one is, um, oh, wait, before I finish, I, I great, brought this great quote that is highly cited by Glenn Martinez, which kind of encapsulates what critical language awareness is. And so it says, if our students walk into the class saying Aiga and walk out saying Aya, there has been, in my estimation, no value added. However, if they walk in saying Aiga and walk out saying either Aya or Aiga and having the ability to defend their use of Aiga if and when they see fit, then there has been value added. It is critical that we strive to allow students to develop this type of sociolinguistic sophistication in our endeavors as SHL educators. And uh, for those of you not familiar with Spanish much, uh, Aiga is a stigmatized form of uh, the verb. The standard form is Aya. And there's a lot of research done on, this is like the classic example of a 
linguistic form that is stigmatized. So this quote by Glenn Martinez really shows us what CLA is trying to do in the classroom with our students. Okay, so my next approach that I want to discuss today is the open education movement. And this is an approach that I think um, uh, goes really well with everything else that I've told you about critical language awareness. It's not in a, it's not replacing another approach. It's in addition to, it's together with. So the open education movement, to start talking about that first, I guess I'll talk a little bit about open educational resources. I'm sure most of you are familiar with OER. I've probably used them maybe even created OER, but uh, they are instructional materials that are freely accessible and openly shared with a Creative Commons or similar open license. And we have what we call the five R's of OER, which means that uh, these materials we can remix, revise, reuse, retain, and redistribute as long as they grant attribution to the author. And in the past uh, decade or so, with the high cost of educational materials, the use of OER has grown a lot because it is really a way to foster social justice and provide all students with necessary resources. And for heritage Spanish instruction, OER have been particularly useful because first, the field is relatively new. There, there wasn't that much out there in terms of resources, textbooks to teach heritage language learners. And also we know, like we talked earlier, that it is very different to teach these students, different student populations all over the country. What works for you might not work for me. So there's no one size fits all methodology. And so uh, instructors have been creating their own materials. And so there is this growing awareness now about OER and the need for OER for SHL teaching. And so there is more availability of these resources such as activities, lesson plans, open textbooks, et cetera, that uh, continues to grow. Now, moving on, uh, within the open education movement, we have open educational practices and open pedagogies. So open educational practice, it stems from OER, but it shifts the focus from resources to practices, so doing. And through this uh, practice, students can engage in participatory pedagogy. So they are participating in the process and creating OER. And then OEP, I mean, open pedagogy emerged as the demonstration of OEP within the context of teaching and learning. And within this practice, students can engage in what we call renewable assignments instead of disposable ones. So to define this quickly, a disposable assignment would be one where a student writes something, the instructor grades it, returns it, the student looks at it, and it promptly goes in the recycling bin. A renewable assignment, on the other hand, is an assignment that after working on it, grading, editing, can serve another purpose, a new purpose, right? So I will explain more and an example of this type of assignment in a little bit, but I want to finish this slide with this quote that I really like from Blythe and Toms that says that the integration of open educational practices and open pedagogies contribute to the democratization of knowledge, both the creation and distribution of it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, examples in a little bit, but first we have to talk about why open pedagogy is useful for our heritage language classrooms. So open pedagogy has learning empowerment as a central pedagogical premise, and it has the ability to optimize the full potential of learning where students can create and curate their own content and contribute to the public domain. And we know that when students come into our classrooms, they already have a wealth of cultural knowledge, pragmatic knowledge, the ability to create culturally and linguistically rich renewable content. And so also we've talked a lot about how empowering students is at the heart of our SHL courses. So open pedagogy, I think is a perfect fit for our classes. So uh, now I'm gonna show you some examples of what we're doing uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, enacting open educational practices. And so just a little bit of background here, our program, we have four courses designed specifically for heritage Spanish learners. And two of the courses are currently based completely on OER developed for our program. So we are implementing the use of OER. And I'll just give you a glimpse of uh, these two. The first one, uh, Proud to be Bilingue, Intermediate Spanish for Heritage Learners. Let me see if this works. Can you, can you see how I changed the screens? I think so, okay. So we have four units, and I'm just gonna quickly show you kind of the themes that I've used to create this course. 
we have four units and I'm not sure if the font is big enough, but you can see Unidad Uno, La Lengua Que Hablamos, The History of Spanish, Spanish en la Actualidad, Currently, De Donde Venimos, Where Do We Come From, La Multiculturalidad, Desde La Época Colonial al Presente, so I'm very interested in multicultural uh, studying the different people who are Spanish speakers, you know, we don't, and, you know, get shying away from all the stereotypes of what is really a Spanish speaker in the U.S. El Español en Estados Unidos, so Spanish in the U.S. and in the world, linguistic diversity, language varieties, and then the last unit, El Futuro y la Utilidad del Español, the future and use, utility of Spanish, technology and artificial intelligence. So uh, these are kind of the topics I use based on what I thought my students would be interested in. And then we have another course that's all based on OER, which is Academic Writing for Heritage Learners, which I created with my colleague, Maria Luisa Chavarria. And for this one, it's a more advanced course, like the title says, and it's uh, a project-based course. We have three projects where students uh, work, the first one in groups, and they write a research paper on a controversial topic relevant to the Hispanic community in the US. The second project is where one, an individual project where they explore their professional field of interest. And there's an emphasis on ethics and diversity and in their professional uh, career that they chose. And then the final project is really helping them get ready to be bilingual, bicultural in their professional field through um, writing their resume, a mock interview, and other, other writing and speaking assignments. So those are the two courses that we have that are based on OER. But what I mostly want to show you today is an example of a course that uses um, open pedagogy. So this is a course called Writing and Culture and Context for Heritage Learners, and it's also project-based. We have three projects where students write a news article, a folk story and an essay. And what they do is they perform research in their communities and then their final projects, they are encouraged to share them as OER using a Creative Commons license. We learn how to use a Creative Commons license, what it means, et cetera. And then we share the materials for other instructors to use in their courses. And I'm happy to say that they're already, my, are these materials being used in another heritage course at Texas A&M Commerce. And uh, in addition to having these great projects created by students, an undergraduate student, Marco Pevia, is creating lesson plans to accompany these projects that middle and high school instructors can use in their own classrooms. So I'll tell you why this is, this is so amazing. So students interview people in their communities, in their families, create a project, and that project becomes an educational material that other students can use. And this is really empowering. It makes the students feel to have this great ownership of the language, and it gives a, a space in the education field for their cultural histories, their backgrounds, their practices. And so I'm going to show you. This is from our website where we have the student projects and lesson plans. And I'm going to, you, there's a QR code if you want to take a look. But I'm can I'm gonna also gonna click here and see if I can show you the project. So this is the Heritage Spanish website. Here we have student projects and lesson plans. And there's two so far: La Noticia y la Leyenda. We're working on adding more, but I'm gonna show you this one for now. Leyendas de nuestra comuni comunidad, written by students at the University of Texas at Austin. And so these are the folk stories that the students wrote based on stories, leyendas, that their family members told them. So they had to interview somebody, write it down, edit, create a new creative ending to the story, find images to illustrate it. We had to, we did a lot of peer review editing, and this, this is the final project. So it's really fun to see how their final projects are something, first that looks great, and it's great content that others can use for learning. So, and I'm gonna give you an example of this one. El hombre lobo que luchó. So the student wrote his leyenda and then at the end, they have the option of thanking the person who helped them. Quiero darle las gracias a mi mamá, Margarita Pevia, 
que siempre me abraza con amor y seguridad. Te quiero, mamá. So for those who don't know Spanish, I want to thank my mom for always, who always hugs me with love and safety, and I love you, mom. So it's really a, a nice way to involve their families, their communities in their academic endeavors for the students and to contribute, right? Because uh, they can contribute to to the field. And so all of these you see here are ideas for teaching with those leyendas. There's lesson plans and just uh, prompts to, for example, study the past tense, or they can use the leyendas as a basis for writing their own stories or comparing two stories, comparing the endings of two different stories. So there's a lot that uh, instructors can do with that, and that is available for anyone to use. And it is a growing project. We keep, we want to keep adding more. So that is my example of open pedagogy. And you already took a look a little bit up at the website for the Texas Coalition for Hater Spanish. That was the website I was on. So I just wanted to share a little bit about this project. Our coalition is part of the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning at UT Austin, also known as CORAL. And uh, we, my colleague Flavia Belpoliti and I created this coalition about eight years ago, I think. And here you can read what our mission is. So to provide a cooperative platform to support the success of Spanish heritage language speakers and their communities in Texas, assisting and promoting bicultural and bilingual development in the state. So we are a group of instructors at universities. We have about 15 universities who we have representatives from. And the idea is to collaborate because we all have similar goals for our heritage Spanish students and creating materials, sharing them, best practices. We have a growing kind of repository of open educational resources for teaching heritage Spanish. Here's the QR code for our website, but I'm going to open it here too so you can see so we have classroom resources, instructor resources, professional development modules, and we have at least one or two webinars every semester. And we have here videos from webinars and previous workshops. We support uh, professional development at all levels of instruction. So we have a workshop every summer that we do in person, and it's for professional development to learn best practices for teaching heritage Spanish. All of those workshops, we try to also record and put the videos online so people can look at if they cannot attend. And I have here our information for our next one, which is actually coming up on Friday, May 31st here at UT Austin. I know this is far for many of you, but the information is here if you're interested, if you wanna share with someone who might be interested. We have a poster present presentations during the workshop as well. And this year we're having a, a full one day workshop. So that is uh, what the Texas Coalition for Heritage Spanish does. We have many different projects and we promote the use and creation of open educational resources. So if anybody needs help creating a resources or knowing or you know trying to learn how to do a remix of a project, because that's one thing I didn't tell you is that one of the courses that I created it's what we call a remix, where you take different parts of other OER and use it to create something that works for you. Because like I said, what works for me won't necessarily work for, for you, but there might be parts that you can use and put together. Text has a Facebook page where you can follow us and you can start any conversation. People can sometimes go and ask for help if they have to start a new program or if they wanna learn how to do something in their classroom. And it's a great community where you can help each other because that's the idea of the coalition is to create community. So now is where I finish with the future, right? I promised you past, present and future. So I can't read the future, but I'm gonna tell you that you know that the US is currently the fifth country with the most native speakers of Spanish in the world. And we know this number continues to grow. And so I think we need to really focus on Spanish in and of the US because really Spanish as a heritage language is the future of our Spanish departments, seeing how our demographics are changing. And I talk about here Spanish departments, like universities, right? 
But we can't just focus on universities. We need to consider heritage learners at all levels, starting at K through 12 through higher ed, how to best serve this student population starting from the beginning, um, or dual language programs, immersion programs, uh, bilingual programs, basically heritage language instruction at all levels. And you know, to, to achieve this, we need more research, of course, and practice needed regarding heritage language learners and how to best serve our student populations. There is a large body of research already and more research that people are doing, which is amazing. But and I like to emphasize practice as well, because personally, you know, I am a teaching faculty. And so teaching is what I do. And I practice has is what has gotten me where I am, being in the classroom every day with my students, learning from them about what they need, what they want, um, what resources would be best for them, how to best serve these students. So I think both are very important. And finally, uh, we really need to continue to enact and to advance these current approaches, such as critical language awareness and open pedagogies, as well as other inclusive practices to be able to achieve student empowerment, community engagement, social justice, and social transformation in our communities. So that is the end of my presentation, some attribution, and my last slide. And I have references at the end if anybody wants them later. But now, let's see how I'm doing on time. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions. Hello. Hi, thank you for your talk, Jocelyn. Uh, my name's Susan, um, and my question is, uh, what steps do you take to identify heritage speakers before they arrive in the L2 class? And if they do end up in the L2 classroom, how do you motivate and support their moving to a more appropriate class? That is a great question, and it's what we've been asking ourselves for a long time. I think every language department struggles with this. So identifying the students and placing them in the right class can be a struggle. We have our, in some, I know that some small departments, small universities, they are able to meet with students. Uh, faculty can meet with each student and have conversations in order to determine what would be the best fit for them. At a large university like mine, that is not feasible. So our first semester of Heritage Spanish is open enrollment. So anyone can enroll if they self-identify. So there's a lot of things we have done to try to get the right students to register for the course. We have lots of information on our website. We created a video where students themselves talk about what the courses are like and what the benefits are for heritage learners. We have tried to have info sessions for many semesters with advisors all over campus for them to help us really advise students properly about which classes they need to take. Uh, sometimes students do email us and come to office hours and ask, "Is should I take this class? But it is also very frequent that we get students in the wrong classes, you know, they, who should be in the heritage language class and they go to the second language class. So another strategy we, we, another strategy we use is to tell all the instructors at the, the first day of class, basically, to identify any heritage language learners and to encourage them to switch over to the heritage track. But as you all know, this is tricky because at that point, the first day of class, schedules and logistics make it complicated. So it is common that uh, we have uh, here and there students who should be in the heritage track who are not. And sometimes they just don't want to be in the heritage track. You know, there's all these different reasons why students decide to stay in the second language class. So it, it can be a challenge, but I think there are strategies that uh, instructors can use to have, you know, to encourage both types of students in the classroom. And, um, you know, you have to be prepared to not rely on your heritage students and kind of, you would say, like, exploit them as they know more than the others. Because it, it can be a challenge that sometimes students who are heritage learners in a second language class can feel bad because the other students maybe more know more metalinguistics, they know more grammatical terms, and they never learned that at home. And on the other hand, the second language learners might be intimidated having a heritage language learner there because sometimes they can speak really well and fluently, whereas a second language learner cannot. So 
the instructors have to be very careful. So I think that's why it's very important to have good training in heritage language teaching and just be aware of the different uh, effective issues that students might have in the classroom as well. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Hi, Joseli, I have a question for you. Um, some TAs have asked me, um, what are these, you know, when we talk about linguistic shaming in the classroom, sometimes uh, when we have mixed classrooms, we are not completely aware of what are these practices that can actually shame or heritage speakers. Um, so can you speak a little bit about that um, for our TAs here that kind of they are more aware of their practices and how not to incur in that kind of, you know, behavior? Thank you. Yeah, that is a tough question. I see this even in my own just heritage classes where they're all heritage learners, but there are such wide, varied levels of proficiency within a heritage language course. Like I said, some who are more receptive versus some who lived in Mexico until they were teenagers, you know. So there are sometimes these feelings of being less because they didn't learn it as well. And I think we just need to foster kind of a, a very inclusive community in the classroom where you make it clear from the beginning that that is the right class for them. If you determine it is the right class for them, then really make it make it so, make the students feel like they belong in that classroom and that regardless of their language level, that they're going to learn. And that's, you know, that's why we're there anyway, to learn. And so, you know, sometimes there are students who don't speak up much because they're intimidated because they know that the other one speaks better than them. So we really need to encourage these students and just try to make them feel safe and encourage the others to have similar approaches towards the ones who don't. And then try to highlight the stuff that they do have in common. So all the co cultural practices or traditions, they're, you know, kind of some of the, the slang words they use, just things that help them connect with, with each other that even though they have different backgrounds and they grew up in different ways, we all do have these similar uh, aspects that we can connect with and just be aware that uh, students can be, you know, feeling sometimes like they don't want to participate as much. And one thing I do is I give an anonymous survey at one point in the semester and I ask that kind of question, how are you feeling? Do you feel like you're, you're included? Um, and a lot of times students will speak up and then you'll just have to address uh, those situations as they come. I'm going to quickly read this one in the chat so everyone can see. So Jessica says, I teach at a small liberal arts college uh, in Pennsylvania and some of my some heritage language speakers end up in my classroom. There's no heritage language class available in my department. What strategies could I use to support these learners? I'm a heritage language speaker myself, so I have intuitions of how to help, but it's hard to figure out how to support in parallel in the L2 classroom. This is a great, I think this is about the differentiated instruction in the classroom. How, what are some of the principles that can help to support that? Yeah, that is a good question because that is the situation for a lot of people, for a lot of programs where they just don't have the capacity to create a whole separate track for heritage learners. So this is going to happen. Um, eventually, I, I think that the population is going to grow enough so that there will be a, ne a need in most places for separate uh, classes for heritage learners. But in the meantime, yes, like you said, uh, differentiated instruction. And there are a lot of resources out there. The Center for uh, Heritage Language Research in California, they have some online modules about differentiated instruction and how to deal with uh, students who are in mixed classes. And one thing I'll say is that I think is a great approach is to have project-based courses because that way you can work with students at their own pace, doing slight, the same thing, but slightly, slightly different based on their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so that way they're all learning and progressing as they do the project. Um, so that is one approach, but 
I would say something else is just to be careful and not use the student who is a heritage speaker as just always the example and single them out. You know, that could be problematic. And the same thing I said earlier about making everybody feel included and how everybody has strengths and weaknesses, because the heritage speaker might be able to speak more, but they might be lacking in some other aspects that the second language learner can help with because they perhaps had have had more education uh, on grammar, et cetera. So just to foster a community where you can help each other, the students can feel like they all belong and that they can all be learning, even if they're learning at slightly different paces. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, well, thank you so much for the talk. And just a question about, we know for a fact that many of the heritage speakers at this level, at the university level, they've already had experiences with languages or the language, the variation of language that they they, they carry with themselves. And, you know, obviously it has implications towards their identity. And we were talking about linguistic insecurity and shaming. So uh, they already, these all these uh, variables are already sort of attached to them and that they carry obviously to, to their own personal experience. So at this level, they're already sort of marked and they have so much uh, a negative experience or experience overall with the language, but at the end, they, they, they still feel like they, they don't have much of a, of, of a, a grand scheme or, or, you know, the, the appropriateness or the appropriate level to develop in the language or to, to speak or to communicate in that sense. So, uh, I know that you had, um, you're working with uh, high schoolers uh, or you have, there's a program, right? Uh, to a certain extent that you reach out to, to, with, to them. So then how can we, uh, well, the question is like knowing this information of like them already being at a certain a stage of um, having a solid identity forged, crafted, uh, how can we start at a much lower level, right? Like the K through 12, like you're saying, and how do we, uh, you know, cause it seems like we're doing this top down approach. So how do we have a more efficient and obviously, uh, uh, uh approach and obviously a more, um, uh, effective, right? And effective and, and yeah. So how do we reach out to those people or how do we implement a system or program that, you know, comes up from the bottom and we can start, you know, shape shifting or, uh, derrocando esos, esas barreras. Gracias. Gracias. Sí, esa es una muy buena pregunta. This, and I'm, I'm glad you're asking this because that means you guys are thinking about these issues, which is what we need. We need people to think, I know, and think about these issues and, and come up with ideas of how to address them, right? And I personally don't work with high school students. I only work with college students, but through our organization, TEX, we really do try to reach out to all levels of instructors, our school districts in our local areas and community college, et cetera, because we would like to extend the you know, the, the idea of sharing best practices and how to help students develop their linguistic practices, but also, like you said, those linguistic insecurities to start addressing them from earlier. And I think if, if teachers are equipped to do that from an earlier age, then they will be better prepared when they come to the university as well. And I do see that at the university, the students who have had more instruction at the high school level, for example, you know, have different approaches than the ones who have never had a single Spanish class in their lives when they come. So I think you have a very big question and I think a lot of more work needs to be done. I think that there need to be more partnerships with institutions at all levels and not isolate ourselves at universities, you know, and just look at higher education but to really reach out and create these partnerships with other universe, with other schools. We have at UT, at one point, we invited instructors, Spanish uh, dual language programs and teachers and Spanish teachers from uh, uh, the Austin Independent School District and welcomed them on our campus and just talked to them because we, like you said, those students are the ones that are coming to us, right, in a few years. And so the more partnerships we have with them, the more we can share about what their students needs are when they're in elementary high school and then when they get to us as well how to work with them so 
when I talked about the future, uh, my last slide about the future, I think that is one of the things we really need to consider. And I'm glad that uh, people who are, you know, graduate students and other people are thinking about this because that's very important. So thank you for that question. Thank you so much, Dr. Miners. We are out of time. Uh, so we will have to leave it there, but thank you. Let's, I mean, for if you're in the audience, uh, applause, if you're on Zoom, we really appreciate it. And tomorrow morning we will have our workshop. And so Dr. Belpoliti uh, uh, will uh, give us some practical applications for this. So this is the big picture, where is it then? And is there anything we need to know about that, Dr. Miners? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, Dr. Belpoliti was going to send you some instructions about okay. how to prepare for tomorrow. But okay, so, so for our days, for we have, um, yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin. This has been a pleasure and very informative.